Hello, this is a video about generating a random value from a given probability distribution. You might not know what a probability distribution is, um, but that doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to consider two examples, a discrete case and a continuous case. And we'll define probability distribution and uh, probability distribution functions uh, as we go. So first, a discrete example. Let's say that we have a chest and you can open the chest and draw a random item from that chest. Maybe A is a very rare item to draw and B is much more common than A. Uh, maybe let's say three times more common than A. So A would be represented with one block and B might re be represented with three blocks. And let's say just for good measure, you can also get C and C is uh, neither rare nor common. It's somewhere in between. And so C gets two blocks. So the question is, how can we define an algorithm to uh, such that we expect to get B three times more often than A and uh, A half as commonly as C? Okay, let's think about it this way. Maybe we could take a bag and we drop one A into the bag, uh, three Bs, and two Cs. And we jumble up the bag real good. Uh, we reach in, we pick one, and that's the value or that's the object uh, that we generate. Um, algorithmically, uh, in code, what we might do instead is assign a number to A, B, and C and then pick a random one of those numbers using a random number generator, uh, look at the random number we generated and then pick the object that we associated or pick the value that we associated with that number. So we could do this. Let's say A, we assign one. B, we assign two, three, and four. And C, we assign five and six. So going through the algorithm, we generate a random, a random number between one and six. So we would do that with some random function, right? Between one and six. And let's say this gives us the value four. So we would say, okay, we picked four. Four is right here. Four is associated with B. And so the value we choose is B. Okay. And again, uh, we can gut check this. Well, B has three chances to be generated by our random generator, uh, and A only has one chance to be generated. So it should be clear that B is three times more probable as A to be chosen. All right, let's move on to a continuous case. Let's draw a circle. And uh, in this case, we want to generate a point randomly somewhere inside the circle. So I think the obvious algorithm is we just pick some random angle, stop when we reach that angle, and then we pick some random radius and multiply this point on our circumference of the circle that we've generated by that random radius to get some point inside the circle. Okay, so let's consider this real quick. Could there be any problems with this? Well, if we pick a random point somewhere in the circle. We know it's going to be distributed radially, so it doesn't matter which direction. It should always have some you know, uniformly distributed angle, so that's not a problem. Um, however, if we look at how many points get generated with a radius of one half or less, it will be half of them, because half of the time, whenever we generate a, generate a radius, it'll be less than one half, and the other half, it'll be greater than one half. So, I think I see the problem here, which is that this inner disk, we should expect fewer points inside of this disk than uh, on this outside ring here, because the amount of area inside this disk is significantly less than the amount of area in this outside ring. Okay. In fact, we could ask some, some questions. Let's break it down into individual rings. So how commonly do we, ex or how much more commonly do we expect to generate a value on this outside ring compared to a value on this uh, ring at a radius of one half? Well, it looks like on the outside, the circumference is double than the circumference of this uh, ring with a radius of one half. So we would expect this ring on the outside to generate points twice as commonly as points on the inside. 
So much like we did over here, where we have a graph, where on the bottom we have potential outputs, and going up we have the probability of getting that output, let's draw a graph over here. So we don't know what our probability distribution is yet, but we can get a good idea. So for a radius value, r equals 1. I'll, I'll write a r uh, there, and I'll put a 1 here and a 0 here. Um, Let's just say that our probability of getting something on this outside ring, the radius of 1, is 1. Uh, the probability of getting something on this half ring should be half of the outside ring. And uh, getting something maybe on this ring here, which is a quarter radius, would be a quarter of the outside ring because the circumference is 1 quarter. So we can see that there's a linear correlation between the radius and the probability. So our probability distribution function should look like this. And of course, there's no chance to generate anything outside of this. So our probability of getting a radius of greater than 1 is 0. And of course, our probability of getting a radius of less than 0 is 0 as well. So our function is entirely defined between 0 and 1. So. Now that we've defined our probability distribution function, let's reconsider the previous algorithm. What were we doing? Well, if we think about it, we assigned numbers to these objects, and then we chose a random number, and we looked at the object that is associated with that number and chose that object as our output. But we can think about it a little bit more continuously. Um, what we did, what we could say is we said, uh, what is the area of our probability distribution function? Well, it's 6. We generated a random area between 1 and 6. And then we filled up our probability distribution until the filled area equaled our random number, our random area that we generated, at which point we stopped, looked at what value we stopped on, and chose that value as our output. Let's do the same thing for our continuous probability distribution function. So, well, what is the area of this triangle? Well, it looks like it's one half. So let's, the area is one half. So let's pick a random value between zero and one half. Eh, let's do one eighth. Why not? So our random value is one eighth. I guess I could, don't know what to call. I'll just say, I'll just write one eighth here. Uh, let's now fill up our triangle with, uh, with an area until we reach 1 eight, one eighth, And then we'll stop and look at what value we've stopped on. Okay, so we're going, we're going, we're going. Ah, looks like we've chose that we've hit 1 eighth of the area. All right, what value did we stop on? Oh, it looks like 1 half. Interesting. Okay, so values less than 1 eighth will generate a quarter of the time, and values greater than 1 eighth will generate 3 quarters of the time. So that kind of lines up with what it looks like, because it looks like this inner area is, you know, about three times smaller than the area of uh, the outside ring. So this lines up with our intuition. How would we do this mathematically? Well, mathematically, it gets a bit more difficult. But we start by defining our function, our probability distribution function. So we have an r, which is a radius. And we have a function p, which tells us the probability of getting a radius. So our probability of getting a radius of 0 is 0. Probability of getting a radius of 1 is 1. So our probability distribution function is a linear function with respect to r, our radius. OK, and how would we describe this mathematically? Well, we want to generate a random unit value, so maybe random. I'll just write it like this programming terms. So random times our area. And we want to fill up our distribution uh, with this area and then stop whenever we hit this area. So how do we get the area of our probability distribution function? Well, that would be an integral. So we would integrate uh, within our range which would be our output range, which is 0 to 1. We would integrate our probability distribution function, p of r, with respect to r. OK, 
And on this other side, we want to fill up our probability distribution function until it reaches uh, this random area that we've generated. So how would we define that? Well, we would say we are integrating from zero to our output radius. I could do R sub O, so output radius. Um, <clears throat> our probability distribution function, R, with respect to R. And now all we need to do is just solve for output radius with respect to uh, our random value. Okay, well, let's go ahead and just finish off this example. Let's plug in our probability distribution function, uh, r, into this equation, and let's see what we get. So we write integral 0 to our output radius for probability distribution function, which is r dr equals our random number, which I think this results in a value between 0 and 1. So I'll write u for our random number times the total area of a probability distribution function, which is de uh, described with the integral from 0 to 1 of our probability distribution function r over r. And <clears throat> now, well, let's just work out these integrals. So the integral of uh, r from 0 to 1, well, I mean, we know that the error is going to be 1 half. So we can just plug in 1 half for this real quick, 1 half. OK, now this, we can use our, um, our power rule, or our, yeah, our integrate power rule, or whatever it is, to figure out that this is going to be r0 squared, so our output uh, radius, over 2. And we set these equal to each other. Now, we know u. We want to figure out what our output radius is. So let's go ahead and cancel, do some algebra. The uh, 1 half cancels on both sides. We get radius output squared equals our uh, unit random value. And we take the square root on both sides. So our output equals the square root of u. And now we have an equation that tells us how to get an output radius or how to get our radius given a uh, random unit value, which is just, again, a uniform uh, random value between 0 and 1, like returned by math.random. OK, cool. So now we can plug this in to our original algorithm uh, instead of just generating a, a uniform radius uh, between 0 and 1. Uh, and now we will get uh, the same number of points, um, or now we get the expected number of points uh, given each potential radius uh, that the point could spawn at. All right, cool. So the takeaway is this is the thing to remember. Um, <clears throat> now, I will clean this up real quick. So in this case, we had r as our output value. Um, and we used rand, the random function, as our, uh, I guess, input random function. Um, and we, we described our, uh, we described our, uh, our ranges for integration in such a way uh, that we could just use a simple probability distribution function. So this does not actually describe um, like this function down here, because this function down here uh, actually is at zero at all places that are outside of uh, 0 to 1 inputs. So uh, really, if we define this properly, it would be a, a piecewise equation where we would say uh, value, or let's see, 0 is less than r is less than 1, or whatever. We could include these. Uh, and it would give us r. Otherwise, it gives us, so otherwise, it gives us 0. OK, so uh, if we define our probability distribution function correctly, we don't need to start at 0. We can start at negative infinity. And we don't need to end at 1. We can go to positive infinity. So the real or the final general equation to, uh, to convert a probability distribution function into a random value generator is to do this. So we integrate over the entire range, which is negative infinity, to our output value, which we're just going to call x. 
uh, our probability distribution function with respect to x dx is equal to, so we're filling up until uh, we hit some area. And the way we generate an area is by taking a random uh, uniform random unit, which is a value between 0 and 1, and multiplying it by the area of the probability distribution function, the total area of the probability distribution function, from negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, we would work through these integrals and then solve for x in terms of u. So I'll write this. So solve for x in terms of u. All right. So this is the whole thing. All right. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, thank you for watching. And... Good luck implementing this because it can be quite difficult in some cases. This was a very easy case. All right.